Welcome to a new edition of the Famous Interviews with Joe Domino. On this episode, we talk with author, advocate, and founder of Dangle and Dot, Nancy Nelson. She believes in the power of an embraced, supportive dementia community, and she understands the growing statistics and negative stigma of dementia that makes this discussion a poignant one. Inspired by a lifetime of lived experiences, she co-created Dangle and Dot to share combined wisdom, knowledge, and insight to empower individuals, friends, and care partner teams to learn to embrace and skillfully navigate the challenges of dementia. Nancy was shocked by the diagnosis of her early onset Alzheimer's in 2013. She began writing down words and phrases coming to her from the sky. This phenomenon helped her to understand her father's dementia journey and her own. Enjoy this fascinating story and interview. Well, hey, it's great to catch up with you. Thanks for taking a minute out today. Well, thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Absolutely. You know, and the last time we kind of had an interchange on email, you kind of opened up a little bit about your life. So I guess where I want to start with this right now is, is that how did you do through COVID? How did COVID change you? What did you learn about your life and things around you? You know, um, I think COVID uh, significantly changed almost everybody's life. And, and I was surprised how I think that it changed mine. So we know that I was diagnosed originally with dementia, in, Alzheimer's, in 2013 and then re-diagnosed in 2017 or 18 with mild cognitive impairment. So I need to say that because um, I think it has, it has hurt many people with a diagnosis such as this, more so or as, at least as much as anyone else and I how I how I I'm very outgoing um, I'm usually out and about all day and um, when when I had to learn how to stay home um, I felt I felt cloistered in but I also felt like you know this isn't half bad it was like teaching me how to slow down but it has given me the the where for all to know that it's okay and so it has really changed me in that way because I, I was always a go-getter and get up and go and do this and do that. And just because you're out and about doesn't really mean that you um, do anything more beneficial. And probably it means you do less, really. So, um, so I, I may be a little more quiet. Um, I, I just got over about with it. And um, that would be my first uh, influence of it. Uh, significantly, other than having to stay in for a couple of years. So, yeah, I, I'm a busy body too. And I remember getting in the car with the kids and going to see, you know, nature sanctuaries and different things. So it's difficult, but I think too, there is a part of this that was good for a lot of people because life did move so fast. Um, so in your current capacity right now, you know, you've, you've sent me some poetry and I know you've had a history, occupational history of doing all kinds of different things. What, if someone asked you what you do for a living, or what have you done for a living? How would you answer that? Um, I would answer that and say that everything that I have ever done professionally um, has led me to where I am today to be as effective as I can be today. And so I look at that. I was in sales. I worked for the airlines for 30 years um, and so flew a lot. Um, I was only a flight attendant for a very short period. I worked most of my airline life uh in the McCarran Airport at, in Las Vegas, Nevada. But um, it was a great life. It was a great way to grow up and see things and all of that. And I went from that to a salesperson. And I worked a little while in the mortuary business, selling underground real estate and, and selling uh, insurance that helped folks. So, um, and the mor what the mortuary taught me was, um, the preciousness of life and being prepared for what what our ending is going to be, and there's no way out of that, and that it's not it doesn't have to be gripping. It can be something that's well prepared. So um, I just think I, I've been lucky. I've been lucky, and uh, I feel blessed. You know, my dad always wanted to get into that business. He was a, uh, he a full blooded Italian. Yeah, he was a full blooded Italian from. Brooke, born in Brooklyn, raised in Long Island. We ended up in Kansas uh -huh. City. And 
he always used to talk about wanting to do that. And I was like, why would you want to be around that? You know, I was younger and I mean, I just, I'm not where I'm at now, but I think about that too, how our society has, has a big problem. Of course, a lot of people do when it comes to death, but he, he just saw it as another part of the process. And he was a salesman. He was a car salesman. So he always thought, uh, that, <laughs> you know, yeah, well, he would love not, to get into something like that, you know? Um, right. He, ne- he never did. Very well. Yeah. 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 But I mean, I remember he used to always like the first thing he would open up was would be the obituaries, and I'm like, "What are you doing?" He's like, "I got to see what what friend or what person I knew that's gone." You know, it's like, man, that's so dark. And but you get to that age where that's that's what you do. It's, that was Facebook then, you know. Yeah, absolutely, it, it, absolutely, yes, it was. And you and it's really, uh, uh, it's. Um, I learned how to stay away from the parts that that um, I was in sales. So I was out and about, and I was at business meetings at 7 a.m. in the morning saying, hey, you know what? You need to think about this. <laughs> and yep. people are going, oh, it's too early. So then I went <laughs> from that to selling uh, Aflac insurance, and I was there making fun of Aflac. And so mm-hmm. uh, it, it was a lot more fun <laughs> when I sold insurance than it was when I uh, was uh, – working for for a mortuary but it does teach you a lot and uh, that uh, life is very very precious and so many people lose people that they haven't taken time for and that's a shame so talk to me a little bit about growing up where, where were you born and raised and what was your childhood like to kind of get you to the point where you're at right now i grew up uh 60 miles north of seattle washington state <clears throat> we had a beach house on camino island and so I grew up with a, a marriage, and my folks were married and divorced. And so I, I went through all the normal stuff. I rode a bike instead. Uh, I'm sorry, I rode a horse instead of a bike when I was young. And you know, we'd climb on the horses and take them to town, ride them to town along the railroad tracks. Um, I had wonderful growing up. Really, I did, even through some of the the hard times. And um, I left there when I was 21 years old and came to Las Vegas, Nevada, and I've been here ever since. And I went from the lush green trees, my dad would just shake his head, uh, to the desert. And um, I, every time I would go home, it would rain and be dark and dreary. And I thought, I never remembered it being this dark and this dreary, but that's where the beautiful green comes from. So you got to give and take a little. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Yeah, we know about that here in the Midwest. We get that whole that that whole spectrum all year long, for sure. Right. Um, so, talk to me a little bit about the dementia community. What What are you doing for it? How do you fit in? What's your hopes? Kind of give me an overview a little bit. Okay. Well, thank you for asking because I think it, uh, communication is so key, and becoming a partner in your own health is so paramount. And we don't want to talk about things that aren't, aren't fun and, and, uh, and that are as, uh, dire as a diagnosis of dementia, Alzheimer's. So the Alzheimer's, uh, the uh, dementia umbrella, uh, is the umbrella for, for many, many other things. And one is the term Alzheimer's, which about 60 or 70 percent of people that are diagnosed with dementia are diagnosed under the Alzheimer's label. I, my dad passed in 2002 uh, from complications of Alzheimer's, and I really didn't think very much of it. I think it's like most kids with parents originally, you know, with parents diagnosed, you don't think you don't think you'll ever get it. So, in 2013, when I got the diagnosis of early onset uh, Alzheimer's, I was shocked, actually. Um, and within days after getting the diagnosis, I started waking up between 3 a.m. and 5 a.m. every morning, and words were just being funneled down from above. I mean, I couldn't write fast enough for these words, and it was, a you know, have you ever journaled? I mean, that, that was my journaling, and from that, I learned many things about myself, many things about what I should do, what I should say, how I was feeling, if I was angry with a doctor, if I didn't like this or or I missed an appointment and, and I hear, are you coming? And I think, oh, my 
stomach would hit the ground, and I'd think, oh, my gosh, I have forgotten again. Um, so I finally, I, I said, you know, kids, I brought my kids with me. My dad was not able to do that, so I knew very little about his uh, journey. Um, long story and for another day. But he and he and I were best buds growing up. Uh, he was a good dad. He was a good dad. Um, and I had a wonderful mother, so I was lucky in that arena. So these poems that came to me, I have written these three books of poetry. It is a journaling of my, my experience of having uh, the two diagnoses. I have volunteered uh, in many places, and um, the Alzheimer's Association put their arms around me initially, and then Cleveland Clinic has been wonderful. I became part of a COBRE study there, which is a five-year brain study. I, uh, I'm interested in helping in any way I can. I, I have not taken a study that calls for pharmaceutical drugs um, so, uh, but in any other way that I can, I public speak. And um, what I have found in 2018, I was named Nevada Senior Citizen of the Year for my volunteering with Alzheimer's. And it took that for me to say, wow, maybe I'm making, maybe I am making a difference. And once you get the bug, you probably know this. Once you get the bug of helping someone and that that comes back to you, you're not asking for it, you're just serving, and all of a sudden you think, wow, this is okay. I, having a diagnosis, I've never owned the title. I never say I have it. I say I've been diagnosed with it, is is not so bad. So that's kind of what, how I've led, led my way with this. I, my poetry usually end with a real hopeful note on the, on the end. I mean, you know, um, it tells people what it's like for me, gives an idea of what it might be like for you. And if it hasn't hit, hit a person's family, it's likely to. It's growing leaps and bounds. So uh, recently I've joined a couple of international uh, coalitions and associations and uh, Dementia Action Alliance is one. Reimagining Dementia Coalition is another. Um, so I'm involved with Cleveland Clinic and the study. And I'm just out there speaking and hoping that I can help someone. And if I can, then that's the purpose for me to continue on. So what kind of responses have you gotten from either your poetry or the work you do, like some in quotes, fan letters that you've received from people? You know, I have gotten so many nice things. And um, uh, I'm going to see if I can find one. I can't remember. You all understand that if I tell you that, right? <laughs> 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 I'm just going to look and see if I have it. Funny you would ask. Um, if I know it, I have it. on my. I was so pleased to get this... Um, this from a, a, a lady. No, and it won't, of course it won't be handy. It's not, and I, and I won't put us through that. Um, but anyway, I just just recently in reimagining dementia, uh, a lady that I have met, uh, I had said it to this group because um, the lady that founded, co-founded, uh, reimagining dementia, in less than a year had seven hundred people sign up from twenty five countries. Uh, saying that they would like to be part of a movement for dementia and helping people to understand and to take it out of a tragedy mode and put it into a uh, to put it into a mode which like a you know if you have to think of it as a performance you know if you have to you know pretend that you're joyful in the beginning but you find joy in what you do. And that's what I say about myself. I think I've found joy in what I'm doing. You know, the, the, the way all of this began with Stephen when I was talking to him uh -huh. about, um, we were talking about, um, I think my son was brought up, and my son's on the autism spectrum. And I had mentioned that when he was younger, we used to go volunteer at a Alzheimer's unit at a nursing home next to us. And it was an exercise class on Saturday mornings. And after a few weeks, my son, who still to this day, he's 17, 
has a very gregarious nature and he's a light when he comes in. People are attracted to him and say uh-huh. hi and he's yeah. just that kind of guy. So they used to always remember him and I always thought that was kind of triumphant. I remember telling Stephen about that and he immediately mentioned you and yeah. your poetry and all that. So, you know, I guess that leads into my idea here too, you know. I think there's almost a level of inevitability that goes into either Alzheimer's or dementia. But is there a way that it can be either slowed down or diverted or something can be done? I know there's research out there, but from a human level, what do you know about this that that, that might help people? Well, you know, and, and for someone that has had uh, uh, autism in your world, um, I, I think – I think we know that um, I think we know that we can make that when we make the best of each situation if we can for as long as we can that we get more out of it. And so I ha- I have and I'm not sure if this is answering your question though. I I'm I'm sure that more people that have a light like your son um, and can draw people in, can help people, right? And yeah. so there's there's joy in that. And so many people, you know, have people in their world that have dementia or autism, and and they can't do that. It's out of fear. They and it's not their fault. We just haven't educated them enough. There is nothing out there to answer your question. Getting back to it, I think I just remembered what I was saying, uh, what you asked. Um, is they're really, they haven't come up with a solution. And, and that's the sad part. There is no cure. And the, the medications that they have, they are now saying, whoa, wait a minute, we don't, we don't think maybe that's the answer. It's the best we have right now. So some people take those medications and they feel like it works for them. And if they feel like it works for them, then it has, hasn't it? You know, I, I out, <laughs> yeah, no, go ahead. You're good. I was just going to say, I chose out of that because I didn't yeah. know enough. And I said, I'm not saying forever, but I'm just saying right now, I don't know enough. And so almost 10 years into this, I don't know enough. And so they really, though, uh, they know and say today, and I used to say it when I very first started and I tiptoed because I'm just little old me. I'm just an ordinary gal trying to figure out what's been laid before her. Um, and so when you get these researchers and these doctors who say, well, this is the key, and they they want you to, you know, take the medications, I there's so many side effects, right? And so that's what caught me. And I, I so I've not ever taken any of the medications. I have done it by, I have done as well as I'm do, doing by the seat of my pants, and about learning about workarounds. So there are things I can't do. I I get really nervous before an interview, or especially if it's a link that I have to find before I can get on a Zoom call. I get so nervous, and I, you know, it could be right in front of me, and I can't see it, and so I shoot myself in my own foot. <laughs> and you have to look for workarounds. I miss appointments. Don't mean to. Um, but I do, and I know they're right there, but I've put them on the wrong day or the wrong hour or something, and it's frustrating. And sometimes, you know, you just don't feel like waking up with a smile on your face. And I have forced myself to not do that. Now, can I always do that? Probably not, as the story goes. But um, maybe, maybe I'll be one of the lucky ones. And I'll live many, many, many more years. There, and it is about healthy living. It is about diet. It is about exercise. It is about being open and have it being curious instead of mad and angry because you've got this diagnosis. Because what what is an early detection is really, really. So I got called on it very early on. And that was a blessing because I've gotten to look at it. I've gotten to bring my children along with me. And so everybody in my family contributes in one way or another. They may go to a book signing with me where where they help with that. Or my one granddaughter spoke at her debate, at her debate, debate team. 
my college grad uh, graduate used to write papers on Alzheimer's. So it's it's a family thing, and yet I try to keep it from them. But the more I get in the weeds and that I make mistakes, uh, I have lost my telephone. I can't tell you how many times this week. I mean, it's not it's normal to lose or put not be able to find your phone. But this week, I not only I, I can't find it. So now today, as I was going off before this uh, this talk with you, I had lost it again. And you know what? I said that's okay. I'm not supposed to have it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, it's you know, a workaround. It's, yeah, it is. And it's interesting, the way you're describing things sounds exactly what I've been involved with, with having a son with special needs. You know, early diagnosis was, was very key and essential for him. And I think about the advancements in science and the knowledge behind things that human beings get, like cancer has, has gotten to a point where people can survive and it can sure. be taken care of. And there's other things that have happened like that. And I think about with... When Miles was born, it was 1 in 150 would be on the spectrum. Now, he doesn't have true autism. He just has elements of, of, uh, uh, of things that would be akin to that because it's a spectrum. And I remember it was 1 in 150, and within like five, four or five years of his birth, it went to like 1 in 25. It's just accelerated. And it's gotten yeah. to a point now where they've diversified their look into this where he, the, what he has essentially – is extra genetic material on his 15th chromosome. And I think scientists are going to get to a point where they can localize that group and there can be therapies that are specific to that kind of thing. And I yeah. think my question to you is this. Do you think, even well beyond both of our lifetimes, that they're going to get to a point where they can find out, either chromosomally or genetically, somewhere along the lines, they can find out where they can, they can grab this and stop it from happening? I, well, I do think I do think that's what they're heading for. Or that's what they're looking at uh, to find to find that kind of uh, a solution. Um, you know, it used to be the plaque on the brain, which I have a fair amount of. Uh, it used to be a telltale sign. Now they're looking and they're saying, "Well, maybe it isn't that." You know, maybe it is this over here. And I, you know, and now they're even talking about alternatives. So alternative, when I first started 10 years ago, and you probably saw this early on, you know, it was, it was far more serious. It was far more uh, that you, you, you know, get your life in order because, you know, it won't be long and, and yada, yada, yada. And now they say, and I say over and over again, gosh, if you knew, what if what you what you could do in, in line of health for you would stop this progression wherever it is and give you an extra 10 years. What if you yourself could do this? This isn't up to holding your hand out and getting a pill. This is up to you participating. And, and uh, it, there's so many of us that, that uh, don't believe it perhaps are too far along when they get the first diagnosis happens a lot. And there's just, you know, it, it's past the point that they can do that. But if you're in a point where you can do it, you're, you, you really ought to give it a chance because they say now lifestyle matters. And I say to you, lifestyle matters. If you're eating better, sleeping better, feeling better, you'll live longer. And you can have workarounds because I have workarounds, and it is what keeps me going. So if we talk in five years from now, what are you going to be happy to tell me? I'm going to, uh, Joe, I'm going to write it on, let's write it on our calendars. I'm going to be happy to tell you that I'm doing fine. I may have regressed a little in the memory issue, maybe not. And that um, I'm still living independent, independent of having to have someone. I mean, I, I I have care partners all over my family level, but but that I can still drive. I want to still drive. If they, if they take that driver's license away from me, Joe, I'm going to be a little little ouchy that day. Yeah. <laughs> Quite honestly, I, um, I want to say I, I'm, I see myself driving. I see myself able to still do many, many things that, that I do now and that the things that I can't do. Uh, so 
you know, it, it's very different when people, when I get someplace and people say to me, uh, oh gosh, you know, there's nothing wrong with you. There's such a stigma. It, it's this, is there a stigma around autism? There's a stigmata and it, and, and it happens more, more times than not closer, closer to home than you think. Oh, it does. And it does. And, and, uh, and so one of the things that, that I, I'm passionate about uh, is that, that we work through the stigma. So I, so I, I, have, I had a close girl. I have a close girlfriend. I'd, I've known her for 25 years. And when I got the diagnosis um, uh, early on, I, would, I said to her, we're going such and such on Sunday about four o'clock, right? And she said, "Oh no, I don't think it's this week at all." And I said, "Well, th- th- I I think it is." So she, well, so she, we got to the coffee house. We sat down to have coffee. There were three or four of us there, and I saw her reach for her phone, which was beside her, and tuck it under the table. And I saw her use her phone, you know, how you pull back so that you don't bring it in to the top of the table and work with it. And then she pulled back and she said, yeah, you're right. That was like a slap in the face to me because she thought because of a diagnosis that I didn't know. Now, 50% of the time she's right, <laughs> right? Hmm. But it was just that cha-ching that made me say, Wow, why couldn't you just have asked me? You yeah. know? Absolutely. And Absolutely. and so yes, and so if people if we could get the the point across, if we could get the point across to people, hey, um this is just another thing, right? As we get older we forget. Right? We need to be easy on people that are getting older and they just forget. Um and so this usually happens earlier, a little bit earlier anyway, and now the early onset is, is happening all the time, and with autism, it's happening very young. And, and I would see people, you know, their, their eyes divert. I used to be in a position where people listened to me, you know. <laughs> they thought, you know, they thought my word was golden, and all of a sudden, it's not so much. And so the eyes divert, and there's more question, and when I say something, it's not not looked at or given the credence that it used to be given or if someone you know introduces me as someone that has dementia and no longer do I get eye contact they only talk to the other person hmm. you know that 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 we need to stop that I, I'm not an idiot because my mind isn't always working okay I just have a mind that comes and goes I don't mean to forget yeah empathy i think that's the that's the bottom line i think we've lost touch with empathy i think there's so I much i think that, we have i mean you know generally human beings are pretty selfish just 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 because i mean there's a part of it that's conscious and there's a part that's that's unconscious because mm-hmm. we have to like survive and there's things that we do and we look out mm-hmm. for our people and mm-hmm. whatnot but i think mm-hmm. there's also a part of this where people are genuinely blind and assume and make assumptions, whether it's skin color or creed or diagnosis. I think there's a lot of things that human beings need to find a way of, uh, of relaxing on or just being okay with it. You know, right. um, I think things would be in a much better place if we could do that. I think so too. And I think now just because the, the, everybody's up in arms and everybody's a little ouchy over everything that it makes mm-hmm. it even worse. But this has been going on for ten years with me, and how, and seventeen years with your son. So, um, or a little less, perhaps, by the time he was old enough to be out and about. But it, it, it is, it is something that, as having gone through it, are we not grateful that we understand that we have to be kinder to other to others, which makes us a better pe- person and feel better, and makes the other person feel better. It's a chain reaction, don't you think? Oh yeah, it most definitely is. And I think the one thing I I realized a long time ago, you know, even before COVID, you know, there's a lot of things that I'm not in control of when it comes to diagnoses and how things, you know, turn out. Um, and, and through the lens of my son, 
the only thing that I'm genuinely in control of is what I do and how I love him. And that's it. Yes. It's the only thing. Yes. You know, and that, if we you can. You know what? And yes. Yes. That's really kind of a good feeling. Yeah. Yeah. You know, hey, and I, and I have, and, 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 and I bless people that maybe shouldn't be blessed because I want them to be okay. I want them to understand that what I just did or missing an appointment or, or whatever, I didn't do that on purpose. I didn't do that to make your day bad. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Can I read a poem? Can you what? May I read a poem? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Please do. Okay. So this is along with what we were talking about about uh, friends and family and and uh, and this ha- this uh, I wrote this for a person that I really liked and he was in the the uh, business meetings uh, every week and uh, it's called a cup of coffee in the morning's heat sharing coffee and ketchup long since last seen a dear friend. Searching to confess, he didn't know how to act or what to say. He stammered to grasp sympathetic words, multiplied his fluster and progressing pink cheeks, all adding to his honest dilemma. To rescue Flash, but to the rescue Flash, my usual ready-to-smile grinny grin, a hug and hello, quick break in. One not from confidence, but he wouldn't know that. Only I was feeling the crumble inside, realizing that it, my smile, seems not so forthcoming and faithful. But more hesitant, flawed somehow, depending, of course, on what I may ask of myself. And today I wanted to genuinely overshadow any beneath the surface, moldy mind decay, his discomfort foremost and first, so that I might answer his tender inquiry. How are you? My warm reassurance reached for his fingertips across the table we held hands. Looking at him eye to empathetic eye, I know. I feel his tenderness. It is difficult to ignore. But stop. Please stop. I am fine. I know I am. Just great. I'm good. Lifting my voice a lilt for him. Assured, adding in cavalier cavalier fashion. Thanks for asking. We chitted, we chatted, this and that, easy as it had always been. We like one another, friend to friend. As I speculate into the unknown, what did he really think? And deducing, perhaps not mine to know, because if I ask him, does he feel he can be truthful? Second coffee drained, and me too, certainly time to go. It's all good. Our hug told me so. We'll see each other again sooner. For time is of the essence and true fans, valuable. Yeah, that's wonderful. Thank you for reading that. Well, thank you for allowing me to. But it it, it came to mind. It was right in with what we were talking about. And I thought, you know, uh, uh, we never know what someone else thinks. We can only surmise. And sometimes I find I'm way off. And um, I don't know, you know, I've gotten a little tender as we go along. As you start to diminish a little bit, um, you, you're you not as, as sure of yourself. And so you don't want to make a mistake or sound foolish or, um, you know, let go, you know, let go of the uh, who I used to be kind of uh, thing. And so um, it, it's, it's good to put ourselves in someone else's place and uh, sit, stand in the, stand behind the chair of the person that you're, that you're thinking about and put yourself, you know, in that chair and that other person behind you. And, and it gives you a whole different perception. I had a whole different perception. Um, And he was a dear friend actually. And I knew that he didn't know what to say. I mean, it was everywhere all over him. And, Um, I think I was successful. I was tired. I remember being tired when I walked away because I had held myself together. And uh, anyway, so I just thought I would. Yeah. That's great. I'm glad you did. 
That happens yeah. to other people. They do the same thing. I don't think, Joe, you and I are different from others. I think uh, I, we're not all alike, obviously. And with dementia, that's true. And with aut- autism, that's also true. Not, you know, not everybody is the same, for sure. But yeah. it is something that we can learn to work within. And if we have workarounds, yep, sometimes uh, it's not what we want it to look like, but... Um, but it works, and then it, it shows others that, hey, maybe you don't have to be afraid of somebody that is diagnosed. Absolutely. Because it usually is, as, it usually is fear, I think, that, that dissuades us into uh, knowing that it's okay. Yeah. That just because Absolutely. someone is different, that we have to react differently. Yeah. So let me ask you this. You know, at the end of the proverbial day, when you think about what you've done with your life and your legacy and what you continue to do, how do you want mm-hmm. people to remember you? Mm. You know, that, thank you. That's a great question. I think I would like, I think I would like people to remen- remember me as having been kind and understanding and made a difference. I, I want people to know that because there's a smile on my face and I'm dressed well and I've got, you know, uh, cheery and my eyes are sparkling doesn't necessarily mean that I've had a, a, an easy day. And, um, and we, can, we can project that cheeriness and that, and it, it's infectious to everybody we we did by the time I walk out, I feel better too. So it is about um, showing up in the best way that you can. We can't always show up with a smile on our face, but we can always set forth uh, loving kindness uh, uh, so that I can hold on to my dignity and uh, my courage to continue on. Nancy, thank you for opening up. This has been wonderful. I appreciate it. Oh, well, thank you for having me. I appreciate that. It's been fun. Absolutely. I'm marking my calendar for five years. I hope we don't wait five years, but um, let's do that. That would be fun. Yeah. One other my, thing. Got to tell you yeah. one other thing. I know you need to go. Uh, Dangle and Dot uh, came to a uh, co-founder and myself, and Dangle is me. I'm living with, and we have earrings that dangle. And the other earring is a dot, and that's the caregiver side. And it is a silent tribute to those people that are walking in dementia and Alzheimer's. And uh, we do have some YouTubes under Dangle and Dot. So please go look at them. So I'm so glad that we had the chance to connect. Yeah, so we'll hopefully, if not in five years before, we'll pick it back up and revisit. Well, maybe once we get this play out and about, we'll, we'll touch you together. Yeah. Absolutely. Thank you. Bye now. Thanks for tuning in to another famous interview with Joe Domino, where we cover the world of art, literature, and music around the globe. If you want to hear more interviews, visit the Famous Interviews with Joe Domino channel on YouTube. Thanks again for listening, and until next time. <laughs>